What's klezmer? I haven't the faintest idea. What is klezmer? It's a music that manages to mean many things to many people. I always think of it as Jewish jazz in terms of expression and what it evokes. I would define it as joy with the tears. <laughs> Hello there and welcome to this part of our music lesson. Now, as you know, we're looking at music from around the world. And this week, we're looking at the amazing music of klezmer, which originated from the Ashkenazi Jews living in Eastern Europe. And you can see in red the sort of area that we're talking about at the end of the 19th century and beginning of the 20th. And like last week, we're going to be using a fantastic documentary to help us through. And that clarinetist that you heard um, just at the end of that clip is a total legend, as you'll find out in a bit. So clarinet is one of the main instruments used in klezmer, along with the fiddle and the cymbalon, which is a, a really cool instrument, as you can see. Um, but klezmer is also, or can also be played on other instruments like the banjo or brass instruments or the saxophone as well. So let's get back into the video and we're going to learn a little about the history of klezmer now. During the early 19th century, there were over five million Jews living in Eastern Europe, many in ghetto communities in cities and others in villages known as shtetls. Life for the majority was basic and difficult. Jews could only live in permitted areas and were restricted to particular professions. The occasions they could forget their troubles were during religious and secular celebrations in which klezmer music played a central part, as did the people who performed it, the musicians known as klezmorim. The klezmorim were freelance professional musicians, available for weddings, funerals and bar mitzvahs. They had more freedom than was usual for Jews at the time, which gave them a certain reputation. They were kind of the bad boys of the, of the Jewish old world in that they didn't respect um, what they were told by the people in the synagogue. They were in the community, but also not in the community. They were, weren't like a proper Jew who has to follow all the traditions. When you gypsy life, you are a little bit different. You not follow all the rules. When you play, you have to be creative. When you're creative, you break the rules. We don't know a lot about the klezmorim. Secular music was not considered important enough to document. By all accounts, they were low down in the pecking order, and it was by no means a lucrative profession. You wouldn't want your daughter to marry one, but no wedding was complete without them. Weddings, weddings were the most, uh, was the main um, place where klezmer musicians could play and earn some money. What's interesting about a Jewish wedding is that often the piece that one would play for the bride can be quite a tearjerker, not an upbeat sort of happy tune necessarily, you know, it's actually often about making everybody cry and feel like, you know, kind of moved. The Badkhan would sing, Oh, my beloved bride, now has come the time in your life when you must leave your home. You thought life was hard before, now it's going to be even harder. You'll have to raise children, the pain of which is too terrible for words. You'll be on your own, your husband will go out and pray all day and go to work, and you'll be at home with the children. All this kind of terrible message about adulthood and you're leaving your mother who's looked after you, and now you're, you're responsible for doing this yourself. And she'd cry. With everyone thoroughly miserable, the ceremony would build to its climax. The bride and groom would sip from a cup of wine. The ring would be placed. And then, the moment everyone had been waiting for. When the groom says, 
I, I will remember the Jerusalem and he breaks the glass. Drzz. This was the cue for the band to launch into a Freylax, a joyful tune. The majority of klezmer tunes are upbeat, and at weddings, guests have a duty to entertain the bride and groom by dancing. They have to dance, you have no choice. You have to stand up and dance, otherwise you're not Jew. <laughs> you have to be happy. It's mitzvah. It's a good, good thing to say, mitzvah, to do. It's mitzvah to dance and mitzvah to be happy at the wedding. Brilliant, and what a great tradition about weddings. My wife also cried at our wedding, but uh, that was for a different reason. <laughs> so, it's worth mentioning at this point that the word klezma simply means musical instruments, and klezmorim, that word, simply means musicians. And that's in the language of Yiddish, which is spoken by the Ashkenazi Jews, and it's sort of a, a Jewish European language which is what klezmer is as a style of music. Now there is also a spiritual element to klezmer. This is brought about by the influence of the Hasidic Jews, which is a kind of um, mystical branch of Jews. Doesn't mean they were mystical, they, didn't, they did exist and they do exist, but they believe in the, the spiritual and mystical side of the religion. So we'll hear more about that now. The Hasids are mystic sects within the Jewish faith. They gave Klezmer some of its most beautiful tunes that grew out of wordless songs that they sang to connect with God. They're the mystical Jews, you know, they're like the Rastas. In fact, I think there's a good reason why there's a similarity of appearance. They have spiritual concerns more at the front of their consciousness and they no doubt pour that into the music. What sounds like football chanting is in fact a niggan, a style of song particular to the Hasids. The most famous klezmer tune in the world came from a Hasidic niggan. Hava Nagila, originally a wordless melody from the Ukraine. It was set to words in the early 1900s. Throughout the 20th century, Hava Nagila was to increase in tempo and popularity while traditional klezmer was to find itself in eclipse. In the late 19th century, there was little demand for joyful music as the Jews of Eastern Europe faced terrifying times. Millions fled from a sustained campaign of persecution and anti-Semitism. By the 1920s, around two million had left for America. About 150,000 came to the UK. The largest of the Jewish communities here lived in London's East End. Some hung on to the culture they came from. Many, however, wanted nothing more to do with it. I wonder if you had ever heard that famous song, Have a Nagila, before. It's familiar, isn't it? And when we think about the persecution of the Jews in Europe, of course we all think about the Nazis and the Holocaust. But as we've heard, it started a long time before that, because by 1920, which was 20 years before the Holocaust, two million Jews had left Europe to go to America and also 150,000 had come to the UK. And after this mass 
exodus and um, with increasing persecution of Jews in Europe, it meant that sadly the music of Klezmer fell into obscurity and no one was really playing it. Jews in America and in England didn't really play their klezmer music, but they adjusted to the styles which were already there. However, there were occasional glimpses of klezmer shining through, such as in the well-known musical Oliver. One of the most successful post-war composers was Lionel Begleiter, better known as Lionel Bart. Born into an East End Jewish family, he would have grown up around Yiddish culture and klezmer music. In his most famous musical, Oliver, Bart reached back into that heritage to give the Jewish thief Fagin a klezmeresque swan song. I'm re will the situation. Can a fellow be a villain all his life? All the trials and tribulations. Better settle down and get myself a wife. And the wife who could can suffer me and come for me and go for me and go for me and nag at me. The fingers she would wag at me, the money she would take of me. A misery she'd make of me. I think I better think it out again. The 1970s saw America celebrate an important birthday. It was 200 years old as an independent nation, and the bicentennial celebrations sparked a new interest in the country's roots. People from all ethnic groups began exploring their own ancestry. It was one film in particular that fueled nostalgia for the descendants of Eastern European Jews. Fiddler on the Roof was an emotional touchstone for reconnecting with a lost heritage. Traditions, traditions. Without our traditions, our lives would be as shaky as... as, as a fiddler on the roof. The grandchildren of the immigrant generation had come face to face with their backgrounds and thought Grandma and Grandpa, Bubba and Zayda, were wonderful people, but they looked so old in, as youngsters, you know. What was it that kept them? Why did they have to work so hard? People started to look for roots. People started to look back at where they had come from, their histories, what their countries were, why the family had come west. Luckily, the mass immigration of Eastern European Jews in the early 1900s had coincided with the beginning of the recording industry. And among those immigrants had been Klezmorim, who had made records. Sir Posnick began to collect them. In the 70s, there was no internet. You know, you couldn't go on YouTube and find it. You really had to hunt around. You had to go through old people's treasures from their grandparents, probably. And, you know, there were trunks under beds and I don't know, cellars full of bins of old stuff and kind of all the, all the good stuff about hoarding uh, produced great treasures. The result was a revelation to those searching for musical roots. So these recordings actually represent a, a wonderful kind of document of, of, of a tradition in transition that was happening at that time when we get a very strong idea of the culture as it was coming over and its change in, in response to Americanization. I like to think of them as sort of three-minute musical Rosetta Stones. That is, they unlock the secrets of this uh, tradition. So as we've heard, from the 1970s, there's been a huge revival in Klezmer, led by that legend, Henry Sapovnik, who recovered all of those old records and began studying them. And Jewish musicians around the world started 
to study this music of klezma and to and started playing it again and the interest in klezma has grown and grown since then and as we're about to learn it's kind of combined with lots of different styles and is going off in all sorts of directions now which is really exciting but also remember that clarinetist from the beginning his name's Oleg and I said he was a legend you're about to find out why and now ladies and gentlemen klezmer tune happy nigun come on Once a month, Oleg Lapidus plays a mixture of klezmer and old-time favourites to the residents of a Jewish care home. In true klezmorim fashion, he has a good memory and a large repertoire. You saw that lady who does that. She is just one of the examples. She just sees the music and she can't walk. She can hardly see it and she can hardly talk now because she deteriorates a lot. But when that music goes, she goes, her, her, her shoulders move, and she is, she is dancing, actually. This is the music of their childhood, of their, of something in their blood. Brilliant. That was fantastic, wasn't it? Well done, Oleg. So as I mentioned, um, klezmer began to fuse with all sorts of different styles all around the world, and this is still going on today. And that, this is how the documentary ends, by showcasing a number of different fusions of klezmer with different genres, and we're going to have a listen to some now. So I really hope you've enjoyed um, discovering the music of klezmer, or maybe you were already aware of it. But I hope you've enjoyed this lesson, and there are a few questions for you to answer on Seesaw before going on to um, the Bluebeard songs, and hopefully you have time for them. See you soon! Bye! For a music that began with such a specific brief, klezmer is proving remarkably adaptable. It's really timeless. I mean, what it, its qualities are timeless. It's something that is both emotional and exciting and spiritual. It appeals to Jews, it appeals to non-Jews, it's a, it's a leveller. Klezmer gives this engine, this edge, this is this something which makes it life. You can mix uh, klezmer music with everything. And if you put a drop, even one drop of klezmer, it starts life. One of the world's most famous classical virtuosos has been inspired by klezmer. Nigel Kennedy plays with the Polish klezmer band Kroka at concerts all over the world. The question arises amongst some people, it's never a question I've asked myself, do you need to be Jewish to play klezmer? Do you need to be black to play the blues? Do you need to be large and Italian to sing opera? I mean, all these things are just obviously not true. And what's interesting is when all kinds of people start playing each other's music and it, it's good for everybody. It's kind of everyone feels respect for each other's music and that's actually the way music develops. The Amsterdam Klezmer Band is at the forefront of the new European Klezmer wave. Since their inception in the 1990s, they've not played straight Klezmer, but borrowed from a variety of other traditions, including Balkan, Gypsy and Ska.
French klezmer clarinetist Yom is influenced by traditional klezmer overlaid with jazz and heavy rock. It's still klezmer, but not as we knew it. Now klezmer music has all kinds of instruments that wouldn't normally have been playing it back then. There are all sorts of different types of klezmer music, ranging from klezmer jazz, klezmer rock, klezmer thrash, traditional klezmer. It covers a very wide range of, of musical styles that all have an influence from East European Jewish wedding music. Well, one, two, three, four, join the marching jobless corps. No work in the factories, no more manufacturing. All the tools are broken, rusted, every wheel and window busted through the city streets. We go idle as a CEO, idle as a CEO. Daniel Kahn is an American klezmer performer based in Berlin. It's one of the more curious aspects of the klezmer story that this music is now huge in Germany. The most prestigious klezmer festival in the world is held in Weimar. Khan's klezmer with a contemporary message confirms that this once forgotten music is most defiantly alive today. The fact that the music can live on in these new ways that feel relevant to new generations is very exciting and very real in a klezmer sense because that's what klezmer musicians would have done. You know, they were living very much as products of the communities in which they lived. They borrowed from the Poles, they borrowed from the Turks. You know, as a true klezmer, it's about that. Jewish, Jewish music has always been about that. People will take it and make of it what they will because it's free to go now. It's been liberated from where it came from and from its status as a museum music. 